Rob, take us back to the summer of 1863, the days leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg. What was happening at the time? The Southern Commander General Lee had just won two big victories, and he's getting ready to invade Pennsylvania. It's kind of important because it's it's the summer, and uh, the Shenandoah is the breadbasket of the Confederacy. It's where all the good farmland is. It's full of Union soldiers, and Lee has to get those soldiers out of the Shenandoah in time for the harvest. So he's aiming for Harrisburg, which is the capital of Pennsylvania, because if he thinks if he can threaten the capital of Pennsylvania, he can get the Union army out in the open where he can destroy him. These guys are halfway through the war. They don't know they're halfway through the war. There's no program that says the war is going to end in April 65. A lot of these Union guys, they've just been beaten consistently in nearly every battle on the East Coast. And the Confederates have won nearly every single battle on the East Coast. So this is what's going on in their heads as they come up here to this fight. These young men and women are marching 20 to 30 miles a day to get up here in the June heat. You mentioned women. Women too? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, there are women out here. They're not carrying rifles, but they're doing just about everything else. I had no idea that the Confederacy was so successful up until that point. Why were they so successful? They have to be successful. They've got less people. They've got less industry. They have to be uh, much more bold in their maneuvers and their actions. And they're, they're pulling it off. They're getting away with it. And yet we don't hear about Harrisburg. We hear about Gettysburg. Why Gettysburg? Because Gettysburg is where the roads come together. Lee will find out that the Union Army is out in the open. They're uh, much closer, and the road network brings them to Gettysburg. And that's where the, that's where the roads meet, and that's where that's the two where the sides. Occurs. That's where the battle occurs. Right. Okay, that's a great place to to pause for a second. Rob, you are a retired Marine Colonel, full name Rob Abbott. Served many years as a as your combat veteran. You've taught history and leadership, and you are now a licensed battlefield guide. What does it take to be a licensed battlefield guide? A lot of work and a lot of luck, I think. We're the only battlefield in the country that requires a federally licensed guide. We have a six to eight hour test that they offer every three to four years. Of about 160 people take the test, they're going to take the top 20. And of those top 20, about eight will pass the oral exam. Oral exam is you have to go out on the battlefield with the head ranger and a couple of cranky old guides, and they work you over for a couple hours. So it's a about a 5% pass rate, pretty hard certification. We got about 150 guys. So that's incredible. So we're speaking to one of the few <laughs> Gettysburg <laughs> licensed battlefield guide. One of the few. Sounds like a familiar slogan for something else. Why did you choose to do this? Why was Gettysburg, I'm sure you've looked at a lot of different military history. That takes a lot of motivation to get through something like that. Why? Why did you choose to do that? Because one of the things we're going to talk about is military uses Gettysburg to train their leaders. They do something called a military staff ride. It goes back to the time when you used to ride horses, where you take soldiers and Marines out on the battlefield and you talk about the battle and you look at the battle through the eyes of the commanders. You have to stand where they would stand and they have to look at what they would know and what they could see. And it's an excellent way of learning leadership. And I've been doing that with the Marine Corps for maybe 20 years. And I figured when I retired, this would be a great thing to try to keep doing. Well, I, I thank you, Rob. This is this is a real honor to speak with you and to be able to take a look at this battle with new eyes from the perspective of where we're at in 2021. Uh, I think we all think we know something about Gettysburg. If someone said to me, well, why is the Battle of Gettysburg important? I could rattle off and say, well, it was a significant battle in the Civil War. But I probably couldn't say that much more. Or in fact, the information is so overwhelming, where would you even begin? So I thought, let's just take a, a smarter look at this, if you will, and kind of work through some of the things that we should know about the Battle of Gettysburg, because we mark the anniversary of the battle right around the same days that we mark the Declaration of Independence. And here, less than 100 years later, Americans were, were fighting and killing each other. And so I want to examine multiple sides of, of this history, uh, these dynamics at play. So let's go back to the march 
that you were mentioning. We have a lot of soldiers converging at one part of the country at one time. It's hot, as you mentioned. They're looking for some resources, it sounds like. They need to they need to feed themselves. Talk to me a little bit about who are these people that are serving on both sides and what do they what do they look like? Well, the average uh, Civil War soldier is about five foot seven, five foot eight, about 143 pounds. By the time they get to Gettysburg, the average soldier is demographically about 20 years old. Uh, we've got some older men and women out here. You've got some younger ones. Army regulation said to be a musician, you could be 12. So we've got some, some kids out here. At this age, they all look like kids. But uh, uh, these men have men have been in the army for maybe two years. Uh, some of them only a year. Most of these are three-year enlistments. Some of them are nine-month enlistments, where these men are older men, like thirty-year-old, and these uh, old guys that uh, have just signed up for nine months. So you've kind of got a mixture on both sides. They've got time left on their enlistment. They're marching up here. They're wearing wool uniforms. The Union have wool underwear. They probably haven't had a shower or a bath in, oh, maybe a month or two. So uh, they're hot. Uh, Their shoes aren't real good. Uh, Most of these guys have got the runs from uh, drinking muddy pond water and eating unripe fruit. Uh, they're subsisting on a diet of sometimes as low as 1,200 calories a day from eating just straight hardtack, little dried peas, little dried pork. So these guys are hungry, they're tired, and they're marching 20 to 30 miles a day in the June heat to get up here, carrying an 11-pound rifle, not nine-pound rifle, two-pound bayonet. What's at stake for them at this point in the war? Well, I think I think everything's at stake because the Union has 12 million people and the South has 9 million people. But of those 9 million, half are slaves. So the Union literally has three times the available manpower as the South. And even if the South keep winning all the battles, they're, they're going to run out of people. So these Southerners know they're going to have to do something desperate to win this battle and win this war. And the Union men, same thing. Election coming up. There's the 1864 election. General Lee likes to read the Union newspapers and he knows there's a rising Democratic Peace Party in the North. And he knows that if he can win big on Northern soil and discredit the Lincoln administration, then Lincoln will lose the election. And whoever comes in to replace Lincoln will make peace with the South. So this this is really a political move to try to leverage in the Northern election cycle. So these Union men know they can't lose on home turf. Because if if Lee wins here, he's going to go on to take Philadelphia and Baltimore and Harrisburg, and Lincoln's going to lose the election. And all the sacrifice will win for nothing. So I think both sides know that everything's at stake here. What have you learned about why? Why they're fighting? And the different people that decided to join the military on both sides, what is their motivation? I think they're fighting on three different levels, personally. I think they're fighting for their nation whether it be the United States to preserve the Union or whether it be to preserve the Southern way of life. I think they're fighting on the middle level for their states because back then the allegiance was to the state. So they're fighting for Pennsylvania or New York or Virginia or Georgia. And on the lowest level, I think they're fighting for each other because these are all National Guard. These aren't like our military today, where everybody's all mixed in together from all over the country, the active duty military. These are all friends, relatives, neighbors. They're all people recruited from the same town, borough, county. They all know each other. You have to fight, because otherwise you can't go home. Was there any indication in the days leading up to Gettysburg that foreshadowed how big of a battle it was going to be? I think the battles are getting progressively larger as as the war goes on. War's been going on for two years now, and they're getting much more ferocious. Early in the war, these battles tend to be kind of big Indian fights with a lot of smoke and a lot of noise and not a lot of people getting hurt. But 
But as time progresses, they're getting much more serious and they're getting much more violent and uh, their casualties are going up on both sides. But the difference is the union can replace the casualties in the Southern South camp. They just don't have the resources to keep this up. It seems kind of archaic to march in lines like that and stand out in the open and fire weapons at each other from 300 yards away. But when you take into account Every time you fire the weapon, it puts out a thick black smoke. And when a thousand people fire a weapon, it puts out really thick black smoke on a hot 87 degree humid day with no wind. And these guys are fighting in chest high crops because it's July and they're short. And uh, the battlefield's loud. So they have no choice but to follow their flags because the flag is the only thing they can see moving through the smoke. So it seems kind of uh, ridiculous and archaic to to crash into each other like that in the smoke, but they really don't have any other way of controlling the movements. What's so interesting about the Civil War is that it was really the first war, and Rob, I'm sure you can speak to this, where, where photography is really being used, which gives us an idea of what these soldiers look like how violent the fighting was and the the eventual well the end of the of the battle which had a lot of casualties those injured and those who died on both sides and sometimes i think we only think about it one way because we know that the north won in this particular battle but there were so many casualties for both the north and the south so in the moments leading up to july 1st what what are what's happening what are both sides what's the strategy that both sides are using are they going into this thinking we're going to really hit each other hard here or do they sort of stumble upon this first part of the battle? I think what you're going to get on the first day at Gettysburg is what's called a meeting engagement, where uh, two forces bump into each other, where neither force intends to fight there. General, the Union commander is a guy named Major General George Gordon Mee. He's a two-star general. Brand new. He's been on the job three days. His orders from Lincoln and uh, the commander-in-chief are to defend Washington and Baltimore. So his army is spread between those two towns and he's moving north to engage the Confederates. So I don't think either one intend to fight here, but this is where the roads come together and this is where the battle will fight, will will occur. So walk us through what happens over the course of the next several days. Well, the left wing of the Union Army, the left or an edge of the Union Army, it's about a third, about 26,000 men, will bump into the Confederate Army. And there's going to be a desperate fight on the first day at Gettysburg. And the Union will lose badly. They're going to, they're wildly outnumbered. And they're going to be pushed back off uh, the ridges to the west of the town. They're going to be pushed back through the, through the town itself and onto what becomes known as the fish hook. And this is a line of hills, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and the Round Tops. And the Union get pushed into this fish hook. And General Meade will make the decision to move the rest of the army to Gettysburg and fight there. And this is that's what happens on the first day. On the second day, General Lee will attempt to turn the Union left. Um, so he will send troops in towards the Round Tops, towards the Peach Orchard. That is not going to work. He's also going to send troops against the Union right on a place called Culp's Hill. And that is not going to work either. On the third day, he's going to attempt a huge infantry attack against the center, which most people know today is called Pickett's Charge. What happens then? Then it rains really hard. It is going to rain so hard that the wounded will drown in the fields. It's going to rain that hard. News of the fall of Vicksburg will come in. And when General Lee finds out about the loss of Vicksburg, it confirms in his mind the decision to retreat. He will pull his wounded out in a wagon train 17 miles long, 17 miles of ambulances, and he's leaving 7,000 wounded men behind that are too bad the wounded to move. The Union Army will chase him. I mean, one of the big myths is that General Meade doesn't pursue. That's not true. He does pursue. It's one long, continuous fight to the Potomac River, but there's a series of battles, but Meade just can't catch him. 
And by the 14th of July, the Confederates would make a back across the Potomac River, and that will end the Gettysburg Campaign. Is is there a way for you to give us some perspective on the more than 50,000, more than 50,000 casualties, Rob? I mean, that is, it's such a large number. And again, that that includes those that were killed in action, those wounded, those missing, some never identified. How do we even wrap our, our head around that number? It's kind of hard. Probably one of the best ways to do it is go on the internet and look up something called the Elliott Burial Map. And there's a civil engineer from Philadelphia that's going to come out to Gettysburg after the battle, and he's going to map the locations of all the graves. And uh, it's a fascinating map because it shows you where all the killing takes place. After the battle, they're going to dig up the Union men and move them into uh, the Soldiers National Cemetery. About 3,512 Union dead. The Confederate dead, about 4,500 Confederate dead, will stay on the field for 10 years in mass graves until the South can raise enough money to afford or have their men dug up and moved. And even then, they're only going to get two thirds of them. And they're going to take the, dig those men up, take them home. Because by then, the only thing you can see is the buttons, the distinctive buttons on their jackets, which will tell you what state they're from which means there's still 1,200 Confederates buried on the Gettysburg battlefield today in unmarked graves. The wounded, there will be 21,000 wounded men left behind in the town for about 2,000 civilians to take care of. South's gonna burn the railroad bridge coming into town. It's gonna take some time to repair that bridge. Union can get maybe two trains a day in and out of Gettysburg, maybe move 800 wounded a day. It's going to take them all summer to move 21,000 wounded men. When Lincoln comes to do the Gettysburg Address in November, there are still wounded men here left over from a July battle. The prisoners, the prisoners will get marched off. And um, neither side does a fairly good job taking care of the prisoners. The Union men will go south where they'll starve to death, and the southern men will go north where many will freeze to death. So uh, the missing, the missing are just missing. They just don't know where they are. But it's the single most costly battle of the American Civil War. It's one out of three of the men that fight her are going to become casualties. It's it, like you said, it's, I don't even know how you wrap your, your head around that. When you're walking at the battlefield, Rob, what, what it, like, what sits most with you about the land, what it saw and what this battle meant for the nation? I think this is a turning point. I, I, I believe it is one of the great turning points of the war. And I think that if, if the union had not won that battle, that the world would be a different place today. You know, we're kind of dissatisfied with the progress of civil rights in America today, but if if the union not won that battle, we wouldn't be having these conversations today. So this is pretty critical in American history. And it's, it's fascinating that we got a lot of uh, foreign visitors because to truly understand America, you have to truly understand Gettysburg. Why is that? Why do you believe that? It's, it's a pivotal change in, in our country. Because it's the, it's the end of the institution of black slavery. The Union's losing all the battles on the East Coast up to this point. And after Gettysburg, they're going to start winning. And it's not just Gettysburg. Gettysburg ends on the 3rd of July. And then Vicksburg will fall. Grant will capture Vicksburg on the 4th of July. And this is kind of a one-two punch for the Confederacy. I mean, this is something they're going to have a hard time recovering from. The timing of Gettysburg always just sits with me because it was only, what, 87 years earlier, if I have my math correct, (laughs) I hope I do, Rob, a little more than 80 years, that on the same calendar date, so July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, in that period, you had the founding fathers coming together and saying, we're going to declare our independence from Britain. And we're going to be a free nation and we're going to chart our own destiny. And then less than 100 years later, the same groups of people are are killing each other 
over what the country will become. I mean, what do you make of those, the fact that the dates are the same, like that, that these, you know, didn't just happen in December. These are the same dates, you know, just separated by a few years. Well, I'm not sure I can make anything out of the dates, but I would tell you that I think the Southerners, a lot of them feel that this is the second war of American independence. They think just like George Washington is creating a new nation, they think they're creating a new nation to chart their own destiny. I think one of the things that people miss out on Gettysburg is that uh, this is a military park, Gettysburg National Military Park. And the subtlety there is that there's nine military parks in the country. And they are intended to be used to train the military. That's why they exist. And we bring thousands of soldiers, airmen, Marines here on a regular basis, and we conduct leadership training here. And it's not just military. It's also first responders. It's also corporate. It's also civilian companies. And we bring them out here, we discuss the battle, and we talk about leadership. And we help to refine America's leaders. It's happening. Uh, A lot of people aren't really paying attention to it. It's like, hey, there's a bunch of guys with short haircuts and muscles running around. Uh, What is that? Well, that's, that's military groups. And that's why this park exists, is to train those folks. And it's history for the sake of history is fascinating, but to use history to help refine our nation's leaders, I think that's the true payoff here. To learn from the past. And because the problems that they're having back then are the exact same problems that we're having today. It's personal relationships. It's trust. It's clear communications. Not a whole lot has changed. Well, I I can speak to uh, men with short haircuts that sometimes show up at Gettysburg. We met because my husband, who's a combat veteran, also does um, some leadership training at the Gettysburg battlefield. And he he is a former Navy SEAL. And I'll tell you this, Rob, I, I don't think he'll mind me saying this. I mean, these are big, tough guys that that are talking about American history, there are sort of lessons that they are taking away. Uh, they have combat experience in, in Iraq and some of them in Afghanistan. And uh, every time my husband comes home from one of these experiences, he's extremely emotional. I mean, the, the, just the weight and the significance of Gettysburg moves him, like physically moves him. And I, I haven't really seen anything like that because it's just so real to, to know that th- this group of people made the ultimate sacrifice, you know, fighting for what they believed in, in such, in such a challenging environment. And that's something I just want to read the numbers because again, I think it's very, it's very easy to forget that 51,000 casualties, 23,000 on one side, 28,000 on the other. So we're talking about a lot of people on both sides. It's not just one. Do, do you ever get emotional about it, Rob? Is there ever a moment that you catch yourself when you're walking at the bat? Is there a moment or a hit that that's again going back to like a story that you love that kind of that just gets you? Well, sometimes I have a hard time telling some of these stories without getting choked up because these are great stories. These are great young Americans on both sides. Yeah, and as you mentioned, young, twenty years old. You said five seven just over 140 pounds or so and and fighting and not necessarily thinking they would wind up in that battle, right? Do you think the soldiers knew the significance of it? I think the Union men know. I think the Confederates are rationalizing that, yeah, we won, but we're retreating. And I think deep down, they kind of know that they didn't win. Final question for you. A couple months after the battle, the Gettysburg Address takes place. The Gettysburg Address, though, was for a a significant reason. It wasn't just for a speech. (laughs) Lincoln was there. President Lincoln was there for a reason. Can you tell us a little bit about why and and remind us of that? Well, it's going to take them a couple of months to bury all these men, all these Union men. And uh, when they're finally going to dedicate the cemetery and they're going to bring a lot of people together, about 20,000 people together in November, November 19th, 1863, 
to dedicate the cemetery. And they're going to bring in a very gifted speaker, a guy named Edward Everett, former governor of Massachusetts, former secretary of state. He's going to speak for two hours from memory. And it's a great speech. Everybody loves it. And then they invite the president to make a few appropriate remarks. And President Lincoln will get up and he will speak for two minutes, 272 words, Gettysburg Address. It's going to happen so quickly, people think it's a joke. They, they don't know when to applaud. They don't get a decent photograph. It's just one blurry photograph of the Gettysburg Address. And the president's going to say a few things. But one thing he says is that the future generations will remember what we say here, but they can never forget what they did here. And that's why people come to Gettysburg, is to remember what they did here. And the thing that, that resonates to me is that Lincoln talks about our unfinished work. <clears throat> And when he says the unfinished work, what he's talking about is the idea that all men and women are created equal. And we're not done, and we got a lot of work left to do. But if it wasn't for Gettysburg, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be having these conversations today. Absolutely, Rob. Thank you. The unfinished work. It's a good place to to land and think a little bit about. Rob, thank you. My great pleasure. <laughs>